Okay, so what we just talked about was a couple of approaches, the binomial and rock approaches. But remember, we were talking about them in terms of data splitting, okay? Imagine you have a thousand points and you use 800 of them to calibrate a really nice model and 200 of them to give you a really nice robust test. Um, we don't always have that luxury. A bunch of you have situations where you, you have relatively few occurrence points per species. And a few years ago, a group of us was essentially asking, how do you deal with that situation? How do you manage a situation where you may only have 10 points? You don't want to present a model without any testing because you don't know if that model is any good. And yet, if you do a data split, you know, an 80-20 split might be two points that you have for testing. That's not enough sample size to do anything in the biome. And even a 50-50 split gives you five points, and that's barely enough to do anything in the binomial, and essentially not enough to do anything with the rock. Yeah, how about that?
10 partitions. Well, now we're going to use n partitions. We're going to leave one out in a given situation, and we're going to see if we can predict that one observation. Yes or no? Okay? But notice that we have n trials of that attempt. Okay? So, for example, here for this one species, we have a prediction. This is the point that was left out. The model is based on all of these, and you can see that one was left out. Here is another prediction, and these were included. And here's a third prediction, and that one was left out. So we're essentially leaving out different points and seeing that the model based on leaving them out was able to or not predict the left out point successfully. So if we're deriving a suitable test statistic, I just want to preface this. Think about flipping a coin. Right? You can get a significant result flipping a coin 10 times. Imagine if I flip a coin 10 times and I get heads. 10 times in a row. That's pretty unlikely. Right? So, 10 is enough when you're flipping a coin. And we'd use the binomial test. We'd ask if the number of successes given the number of trials is unexpected given an expected success rate of 0.5. So what we're about to do with our, uh, with our jackknife test here is exactly the same as that, except that the underlying probability of a success is different from one trial to the next. And you just saw that because these areas are different. This is a very broad one, and this is a very narrow one. Okay? So it's just like using the binomial test across coin flips except that the probability of a success varies between trials. And so what my co-authors did in this paper was to derive a way of combining those probabilities across multiple trials. So a good model would successfully predict a, a high proportion of test localities and not predict much of the rest of the study. So you know, this is basically restating the, uh, the binomial. Uh, we can very easily count how many uh, successes we have. The problem is, as always, the absence of information. How much of the rest of the study area to include is good or bad? I'm not going to go through the full derivation. I'd rather you read the paper, OK? Uh, but again, what I'm after here is that the underlying probability of a success is variable. And so uh, my colleagues were seeking a statistic that combines the information from these different trials. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through the, the details. Uh, at the end of the day, you can obtain a p-value by probability, by calculating the probability uh, that these, this test statistic is, is greater than a certain null expectation. Uh, and so, again, the full derivation is in the paper. And they provide a little piece of software, which you have on your USB key. Uh, but there is this caveat. I want you to think about it. When we have very few points, maybe five, I leave this one out and I build a model based on these four. And then in the second trial, I leave this one out and I build a model based on these four. There's a fair amount of difference between those two calibration attempts. Three points are held in common and two points trade. Right? Now, if we get up to 20, if we get up to high numbers of points, 
we're keeping almost all the points the same, and we're just trading out. And so really, our model is not as independent. And so there's this important caveat that the assumption of independence between jackknife trials is violated at larger sample sizes. So at the very maximum, you wouldn't use this test for more than about 20 occurrences. Okay? So there's the, the paper that provides the, the derivation, and it also provides this nice little piece of software where what you can see is loaded in a text file that had two columns. Remember we did, let's say we had 10 points, so we did 10 trials, each leaving out one of the points, right? And so this first column is whether the resulting model predicted successfully the point that was left out. So no, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, yes. And the second column is the proportion of the study area that was predicted present. Okay? So, so that's a lot like a binomial. Except that in a binomial, that column would all be 0.5. You with me? And so they run this, and I think if, if we could see, it would say the probability, I think, is 0 0.00007. So this is a trick that you can use when you're dealing with those rare species or poorly known species where there aren't many records. 